This is Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan. Welcome to The Dr. E Show, a show exploring the frontiers of our human possibilities in areas like health and wellness, science and spirituality, quantum biology, and conscious living, so that together we can awaken the best of ourselves and create our most joyful and fulfilling lives. My guest today is world-class personal trainer, Charlie Reed. One glance at Charlie's impressive resume, and you know that this is a man on the journey of true mastery. But what sets Charlie apart from other personal trainers is not just his massively long list of professional accolades, trainings, and certifications, but the fact that he radiates a genuine zest for life, instantly palpable to anyone who works with him. Charlie is constantly using his own body as a lab for experimentation and learning, and the results are stunning. At five foot 11 inches tall and 210 pounds, Charlie has been able to perform the human flag. He has been able to do a pull up with over 100 additional pounds attached to him. He has been able to bear crawl on all fours over half mile in under 45 minutes. He has completed 500 burpees with push-ups in under an hour. He has performed a one-arm overhead press of the 106-pound beast kettlebell. The list of incredible, geeky, crazy, superhuman feats goes on and on like this. Perhaps most impressive of all, he has been able to fully rehab himself from a seemingly debilitating meniscus tear injury. Not only did he not allow the injury to limit him, he went on to break his own personal best, deadlifting 475 pounds and bench pressing 350 pounds, winning first place overall in a powerlifting championship after only six months of dedicated training post-surgery. To top it all off, Charlie is an actual real-life rock star who has toured around the country with his professional rock band. Charlie has the physique of a well-trained professional sportsman, the brains of a nerdy scientist. He has a heart of gold, an incredible sense of humor, and the most awesome rock star haircut. Please help me in welcoming one of my favorite people in the world, Mr. Charlie Reed. Well, I feel like he summed up the whole podcast. <laughs> That's awesome. Yay, welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for making time to join our show. So let's get right into it. Let's you it. and I share a really similar community or communities filled with all these super high achieving, successful entrepreneurs and visionaries and leaders, um, super moms, super dads. So tell us about that dance between our ability to be comfortable with discomfort and where we're risking burnout and overtraining. Because I know you have an interesting personal story of also injuring yourself, burning out, and having to learn those lessons on a very personal level. Yeah, you know, I always joke that uh, if personal trainers don't burn out at least one time in their career, then they're, uh, they probably haven't been in it long enough. So it's a common thing that people in fitness are incredibly enthusiastic about what they do. And, um, you know, when, you, when, you, when your body changes, you get really inspired to do more and do more and do more. And, and I think part of the ego wants you to keep pushing and keep going. Um, but uh, eventually that can become, uh, it can become deafeningly loud in your, in your, where you actually end up causing issues with your physiology and your psychology. Um, I put myself in the hospital a couple of times, basically over exercising. And, um, you know, we have a, we talk about a healthcare crisis in this country, but there's also another side of, of over exercisers that we don't often talk a lot about. And so that's kind of my key message for people is understanding that balance as you, as you've mentioned. And I think the first part of it is learning to listen in and tune into the signals of your own body. And, and the second part I would say to that is that a lot of people will engage in exercise at kind of this middle level, but they don't really know how to go very hard and they don't really know how to ramp down. So they kind of stay in this moderate level of, of work over a long period of time. And, and really that middle level doesn't really increase your levels of fitness as much. Uh, and it certainly doesn't help you recover. So really helping people to understand this toggle between putting in meaningful, effortful work when it's appropriate and learning how to ramp your system down when you're done, I think is a, is a valuable skill set. I also call it finding gears. So if you look at really good uh, world-class athletes, 
especially the ones that can stay in the game long enough, the majority of their training is actually um, fairly light to moderate work. And about 20% of their work is incredibly hard. And so if you take that lesson, we should really learn how to, um, to toggle between those two, two uh, realms and learn how to recover and learn how to really be focused on the work that you're doing, which can carry over to so many things in life. And I, I relate this to people we work with, as you mentioned, people in the tech arena here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you know, a lot of tech companies are getting more hip to understanding the value of things like meditation and um, creating space to allow for creativity and whatnot. And so why aren't we also carrying that into our movement practice? And so that's a message that I really try to get across to people is um, learning how to do more with less sometimes and learning how to be focused with their effort when they are working. Hmm. How did you tell us a bit more about your journey of burnout and injury? What are some, what was your personal journey like? And tell us about the frustrations and how you overcame those frustrations to learn and grow from these experiences of burnout and injury. Sure. Um, well, I was an overweight teenager in high school, so I, uh, I got into fitness because I wanted to lose weight. And so I lost about 50 pounds um, when I was 16 years old. And of course, you're like, well, this is great. I want to keep going. I want to keep going. Um, and that carried all the way out through, through about college. And, uh, you know, I, I just kept pushing through and competing. And early on, I was in my early 20s, I was competing in um, Olympic weightlifting and got into powerlifting and these other strength athletics um, but I just started doing, I really, my curiosity started turning into like, how much can I get away with almost, which really becomes less about curiosity and more about like, almost like, um, this sick obsession with how, how much I, how much punishment I could put my body through and see if I could survive almost. And, um, so when I was, see, I was about 25 years old. Um, I ended up putting myself in the hospital from what I suspect was just, uh, fatigue, overworked. I um, but completely crashed. I had uh, what at the time was told I had some kind of adrenal fatigue or adrenal burnout. And um, it took me uh, about two years, I would say, to really pull myself out of that hole. But it was one of the most valuable lessons I ever learned in my life. And what, and what I learned was when you have an experience like that, you have two choices. You can either keep going down that road, which will end up leading to more injury, or you can choose to figure out another way. And my other way was figuring out this recovery piece. And I started talking with athletes and say, well, what do you, you know, let me see what you're doing in your workouts. And they're like, well, this is my recovery day. And I'd be like, what's a recovery day? You mean like not working out or like, I don't like, and the, this idea was completely novel to me that I would go into the gym and do like a workout that where I would leave feeling better than when I went in. And I just like, why are you wasting your time? You're either going to go in and crush it or you're just not going to show up that day. You know what I mean? Um, and so that was a big paradigm shift for me. And I started reading, you know, more contemporary training materials that talked about this concept of being strong, but staying fresh. And I came across a guy's uh, work. His name is Pavel Satsulin. He's a Russian guy. And he's actually responsible for the modern kettlebell revolution now. So kettlebells have always been around, but he kind of made them repopularized again in the late 90s. And his book was really simple. He said his first book was called Power to the People, Russian Strength Secrets for All Hard Living Types or something like that. It was really cheesy marketing, but the material in it was very good. Um, and what he said was he, he literally just said, I want you to do two exercises, a press and a pull. So it was a deadlift and a, uh, you know, an overhead press. And you're going to do two sets of five. And you're going to do that a few times a week. And you're going to leave the gym feeling better than when you went in. And I was like, two all right, I'm going to- sets of five. That's it. Two sets so it of takes like less than a minute. Oh my God. It's so simple. So crazy simple. And I was like, this can't possibly be, you know, effective. Mm -hmm. And because all the stuff I had been reading was from muscle and fitness and, and bodybuilding magazines. I think it's common amongst young teenage boys to get into um, weightlifting from bodybuilding magazines. Cause you're like, you know, I want to have bad big muscles. And at that time I was really interested in just getting stronger and just feeling good. And, uh, so I started lifting like this and realizing that like, man, I'm actually getting stronger doing less and I feel better and I have more energy to do other things. And so that was the, the switch for me. Um, not that there's not value, you know, bodybuilders are going to do what they're going to do, but I think people misunderstand that you don't have to do, uh, you know, crazy superhero workouts to, to, get stronger. And a lot of strength is actually a skill, you know, Pavel taught me that early on too, that 
Strength is a teaching your brain, your nervous system, how to recruit more of the muscle fibers you already have. We already have an incredible amount of capacity, but you just don't know it yet, right? Isn't that a great analogy for life? And your muscles the same way. You only use, you know, 30 to 40% of the muscles you have. But when you learn how to create tension through skill, right? Just like playing the piano, you're, you're enhancing that ability to recruit more of what you have, uh, then you're instantly stronger. So um, it's a really, really neat take home point. And I also really believe that strength is the uh, goblet to which all of these other qualities fit in. Um, and I can't uh, take credit for that quote. I think it was Dan John or somebody that came up with that. But really strength for me, strength and mobility are the two big qualities that precede a lot of other physical qualities. So if I know that you, if I know you're stronger, I know your ligaments, tendons, joint capsules, muscles are all strong enough to handle endurance athletics. So a big trend in endurance athletics now is just getting stronger. Um, the endurance athletes I train now, we do a lot of um, what would be considered heavy lifting for those communities. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that getting stronger improves neuromuscular efficiency and the ability to absorb and redirect force. Um, and just durability to, to weather the season. Um, and also because a, a large part of my interest in research is on mobility and flexibility training, one of the dirty little secrets of mobility is actually getting stronger. So if you strength train through a full range of motion, you can actually get appreciable changes in usable range of motion, which is also a, a paradigm shift for a lot of people who have done a lot of stretching and they realize they can actually get more flexible um, by not having to stretch as much. So. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Wow. <laughs> so is that what you credit for having your incredible championship results after knee injury? That this methodical quality instead of quantity focused training? Yeah. So, so that was definitely one of the keystone pieces of that uh, journey for me was um, doing a lot of recovery based work and having very focused strength training, learning to listen to my body. Uh, and after my knee surgery it was really about just getting more low level movement. Um, you know, just going for starting off just walking, like I would just start walking to work every day, you know, and I do a lot of joint mobility. So we talk about that a lot in our sessions. I'm really big on rotating your joints to their full range of motion every day. Um, I think that's a message that needs to be heard. We have um, a lot of people will talk about cardiovascular exercise, the runners, the cyclists, et cetera. Um, and then we have the strength aficionados that love to lift heavy things. Yeah. Um, not a lot of people are talking about the joint piece. And if your joints don't function well, uh, then you can't move your muscles <laughs> or work your cardiovascular system. So um, I think we need to start being, I, I'd like to take more of a joint first approach when it comes to training in that way, because uh, when your joints are functioning well, you can express force and absorb force well. Um, and also as a long-term thing, uh, you know, mobility is such a big, important part of uh, the aging process. We want to make sure that we are able to express as much of our range of motion as we can um, as, we, as we age. So that's a big part of it, the, the joint piece. And, um, and yeah, and just doing a lot more movement and a lot less exercise, you know, like exercise, even though it's valuable, it's encouraging a, a culture of movement is I think where we need to start moving towards. Um, and, you know, companies are talking about this with taking lunch breaks and walking or doing walking meetings. Or um, I think Google at one time had a meeting bike where they all faced each other and like, you know, what I mean? have you seen that thing? Yeah. It's crazy. I don't know how like, like, I don't know how they steer it, but um, yeah, exercise is really great, but it doesn't undo all of the sedentary, sedentaryism, sedentarianism, excuse me, that happens yeah. throughout the rest of your life. So more movement, less exercise in that sense. And, um, and also, you know, for the athletes, I encourage them to consider if they can, if they're not professional athletes, they're not getting paid for this, you know, compete once or twice a year, peak once or twice a year, and then spend the rest of the year, um, just maintaining your general fitness or working on other things, you know, for power lifters, I'm a big fan of, of considering, you know, peaking one or two times, maybe one or two big competitions mm -hmm. in a year. Um, and that's kind of the, the strategy that I took. Will that make you world class? Uh, I can't say that's true. I mean, but uh, if you're in this journey um, to better yourself and and to make yourself stronger, um, then you certainly don't have to you know compete every weekend in a powerlifting meet. You know, and obviously the more specialized you get, uh, the more you're riding that razor's edge of injury if you continue to try and peak 
all the time. So, um, yeah, so those are the messages I try to get across and, um, you know, they're really, really important. And I don't think a lot, not a lot of people are talking about those things. So, yeah, I love your, um, holistic and unconventional approach to training where it's like, it's like, it's really a big consciousness shift for a human being Mm -hmm. because we come from a world where we think that we have to, we have all these beliefs around, like, I have to suffer and hurt myself to earn my success. That's just not in personal training and fitness, but in life, you know, that's a big Mm -hmm. consciousness shift. Why don't I deserve to enjoy the gifts and rewards of life from a state of ease and flow and joy? Why do I have to beat myself up to, to do that? You know, why do I have to hurt myself on that journey and sacrifice? You know, that's really a big consciousness shift across the board in every area of life. I totally agree. And, you know, and also seeing all the the integrating different disciplines in together in a f- refreshing new way. That's really what you do in your training style is that you have so many different rehab modalities that you've woven together and brought it outside of rehab into healthy functional movement for people beyond just rehabbing an injury. Yeah. You know, I have to give my clients a lot of credit for, for taking faith in that approach because so much of the fitness world is really about this concept of sweat equity. So if it's not hard or I'm not sweating on the giant puddle on the ground, then it's not worth it. I, it didn't do anything. Yeah. And that, me- that, that message just needs to be squashed. You know, it's, it's really only uh, setting us back. And, um, it's just not true. It's just absolutely not true. And, um, you know, I think a lot of our fitness information comes out of, you know, athletics. So we look at what elite athletes are doing and a lot of our sports science comes out of, um, training athletes. But the reality is that the people consuming fitness, they're not athletes. And so I don't get why people are trying to treat people like they're professional athletes because they're not. And also nobody's looking at, I shouldn't say nobody. I'm a lot of the research is done on 20 something, you know, uh, college kids, you know, a lot of the research is, but we're not looking at, well, what about the 35 plus crowd and, and how, and so we're trying to jam a square peg in a round hole for people that are consuming fitness information that may not be for them. And so how do we adapt the, this understanding of physiology and exercise science, but apply it to the population in front of us. And it always disheartens me when I go to workshops and they're saying like, train like an athlete and here's a 90 day program to getting super jacked. And, you know, and it's like, well, (laughs) first of all, who are you working with? And second of all, is, is that going to work with the population you're working for? So I, you know, and with the trainers that I, that I work with and that I mentor, I always encourage them to be better critical thinkers and to absorb information that's useful, but be able to apply it to the people in front of them because a program that may have been written for an elite athlete, uh, is not going to work for somebody that's, you know, perimenopausal and female, <laughs> you know, it's a different, uh, it's a different strategy you have to take. And going back to our less is more thing, you know, a lot of people, uh, they don't need as high of a dose as an elite athlete is. They're going to get a lot of benefit out of, um, you know, less intensity. Uh, and also from a, a motivation standpoint, if you introduce pleasure into the body and, and introduce feeling good first, then you're going to be more motivated to want to um, challenge yourself more, right? If it's, if it hurts and it sucks all the time, you're going to wear out your motivation pretty darn quick. So, and that pervades medicine that pervades, you know, massage therapy. Like why don't you introduce the body to what it feels like to feel good instead of just saying, I need to do super hard, deep tissue work right away. And like jam my elbow into somebody like, why can't we introduce somebody to the pleasurable sensation of movement um, and motion into the tissues in a way that's not threatening to the nervous system and to the body. And then I think that, that, that will, you know, plant the seeds that will blossom into other movement opportunities when you can get somebody to not hurt, <laughs> you know, yeah. not feel like they have to crush themselves. We've talked about this before. You're not a fan of one size fit all strategies. No. You're a fan of really individually customizing based on that unique client's needs and goals and, mm-hmm. and you know, motivation for training their body. Yeah. But if you were to apply the 80-20 rule for the majority of us, can you step us through a thinking process of how to go from, you know, 
like getting clear what is my motivation for movement and exercise into how to weave together a holistically oriented movement plan. Sure. Yeah, I'll you give you have a, a thought thought journey that you can take us through. Totally. I'll I'll give you a basic framework, a basic template. So First of all, the purpose piece is big, and that's something that people really have to unpack for themselves, uh, and that might take a long time. You know, usually when people come to personal training, they'll, they don't usually come to you and say, I would like to back squat 400 pounds in the next nine months. I have three days to train a week. <laughs> usually people aren't that clear when it comes to, to fitness stuff. They just generally come in and they have these general statements of, I'm kind of fat and tired and I don't feel like I used to, what do I do? Um, and so we have to kind of unpack that a little bit. But the next piece I would say is, is as you're starting to have them write their own fitness mission statement, like why are you doing what you're doing? Mm-hmm. Um, again, going back to that uh, elite athlete piece, like if you're not getting paid to train, then you should really start to draft why you're doing what you're doing. And that could be, I want to have more energy so that I can run the company that I'm really passionate about. Um, I want to be able to play with my kids uh, when I'm older. Uh, things of that nature. Those are those are really big purpose points that really should be in the um, in the front of your mind when you're approaching your exercise, which keeps you honest with why you're doing what you're doing. If you're doing, you know, a thousand jump squats, or like when I did 500 burpees in an hour, like why was I doing that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and not to say that's not a bad thing. It's just if it informs your purpose, then go for it. You know, but if you're doing things just to just to get tired, then we have to start to unpack why why you're going down that road. Wait, a quick tangent. Why did you do 500 burpees? Just pure. I, I think I saw a boxer do it online one time. My my roommate and I were looking at it. We're like, nah, we could do that. 500 burpees. Yeah. And I we actually calculated out because we're such nerds. We're like, it would, it would. I think it's basically one burpee every seven seconds, continuously for an hour. Wow. And so we like tried to pace ourselves. So we would set up it where we, okay, we're going to do one burpee every 20 seconds. And then we would taper it, excuse me, taper it down over the weeks. Um, but yeah, it was just a, a sick obsession to see what I could do, you know? Um, <laughs> just like we bear crawled Alamo square, which is over a half mile and just decide, well, how, how, what can a human do with the bear crawl? Um, and, uh, where was I? So I was getting after the, the unpacking. Yeah, so that the whole, whole journey of going from purpose, getting clarity yeah. about purpose, and then yeah. what's the next step? And then the next step is what I call movement profiling. So I look at what – I like to start and navigate on people's maps. So I want to see what they've been doing, what they gravitate towards, and what they like doing because that might tell me something about their motivation and, and also their beliefs, so like what they believe is going to be good for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in a movement profile, I want to see, do you have some activities? And again, this can change for the person based on their needs. But generally, I want to see something that involves uh, joint health. So some kind of joint mobility piece, which most people are missing. Mm-hmm. Are you rotating your joints every day? The second piece is strength. So are you participating in some kind of strength training activity? Mm-hmm. And if I had to put a number on that, I would say two, uh, maybe three days a week if possible. And it doesn't have to be even a full hour, you know, a, a strength training session can be achieved in 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes. Um, it can be fairly simple. Uh, do you have some kind of cardiovascular activity? Um, again, heart health, vascular health, those are important things. So I want to make sure that you're um, getting some kind of aerobic exercise in. And a lot of people you'll see, they tend to bias towards one type of activity. So they'll be doing yoga six days a week. And maybe yoga really served them initially, and then yoga might have started to hurt them because they're overstretching themselves. They do not have, they've been neglecting their strength piece. Maybe their aerobic health has started to diminish and they just notice that they don't, yoga doesn't feel right in their body anymore. So I say, okay, well, if you've been doing six days of yoga, why don't we cut down to three? Is that possible? And maybe we can inject two days a week of strength training. Um, My good friend, Jules Mitchell and I just released our mobility based conditioning course Sorry for the shameless plug. But, yeah, the, plug away. but the genesis of that course was, you know, Jules and I were talking about how can we get yoga people to do more active range of motion work and more strength training mm. in the culture that they're already in. So a lot of times yoga people have a bias towards strength training is like, I'm not a meathead. I don't associate myself with being in a gym. I don't like that environment. Mm-hmm. Totally fine. Well, you don't have to lift weights to, to get stronger. It's your intention and what you do. And there's plenty of body weight exercises that you can do that are wonderful for strength training. Mm-hmm. As you know, as we've been training together. Um, and so we basically injected these strength skills 
gymnastic kind of base strength skills into yoga classes. So why not inject a couple of cool tricks like a pistol squat or a one arm push up or work towards these things that could be folded into your asana practice. Um, so yeah. So in my case, I carry my growing toddler boy and I do air squats with weighted toddler weights <laughs> and toddler toddlers are super wiggly so it makes it yes. extra challenging <laughs> yeah and i have to do my breathing and my core stability exactly it's perfect yeah nothing nothing turns a reactive core better than a baby <laughs> so so yeah the movement profiling piece would be be another part of that and then from there we start to get into the nuts and bolts of, of programming but um, i like to see you know if all those pieces are in place uh, it's like a you want a well-rounded movement diet right you talk about your fruits and vegetables and all that. And a lot of people are biased towards um, uh, too much of one thing and not enough of another. So health is really about creating that balance. Um, so that's kind of where I, that's a kind of a general umbrella analysis of kind of how I look at, at people's um, movement diet, if you will. Here's the interesting thing. The, the term biohacking has gotten really popular in our culture because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't know what is your definition of biohacking, but to me, it sounds like the, the attitude of having shortcut nature. And what's so interesting about that is that in some ways, the ancient Chinese Taoists and martial arts masters are the ultimate biohackers, right? That have been around for millennia. They've been experimenting with their physiology for thousands of years and fine-tuned and found the most efficient and optimal ways of training a body, not just for strength, flexibility, and mobility and agility, but also longevity, so I really have a lot of respect for the Eastern martial arts traditions. And when I look at the teachings there, everything is about living in harmony with nature. Mm. And so it's like the opposite of hacking, mm. you know? So it's really about a state of surrender and flow and deep listening, deep self-awareness and cultivating that long-term student attitude of learning how nature works. Yeah. And so it's like the opposite of hacking in some yeah. way. So tell us your views about that, that, that whole journey of, of hacking our physiology and the dance between that and this kind of like surrender and flow state that we, many of us are also seeking. Yeah. <laughs> I keep revisiting this hacking thing because I keep, you know, I, I wonder why the, the biohacking movement is so popular and I, I keep going back to this notion of uncertainty. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world and very analytical people. And of course, a lot of this was born out of the, the tech um, kind of bubble. Right. And so this tech culture, it fits with their ethos, which really tends to love quantifying things, right? Mm -hmm. So if I have a number, it means something. Yeah. Um, so if it gets people in the door, their foot in the door and helps them to explore. I think it's a wonderful thing. But ultimately, as you've mentioned, um, people will, uh, it's very limiting and the technology is very limiting. In fact, if you ask people that have been developing this technology and researching this technology, it's still very young. Uh, it is not always accurate. And there's multiple variables that are constantly interweaving with each other. And because we have this incredibly vast, um, our physiology is incredibly complex and not only is our physiology complex, our physiology is a microcosm inside of a culture, inside of nature. And, you know, it's this huge, vast, complex, chaotic thing and you can't possibly quantify everything. So, but I think it's their way of reconciling uncertainty. So it's, it's safe for them if they have a number on their HRV score, like today I was 80 today, I know I'm better. But as you mentioned, so the term I came up with is bio nurturing. So encouraging bio nurturance in the sense that even if the machine were accurate, if you can't even interpret the signals within your own physiology, how is that going to be meaningful? How are you going to weigh that against what you're measuring? And, you know, talking about, um, you know, um, ancient uh, traditions and Chinese martial art, you know, I'm continuously fascinated by the Shaolin temple and how the Shaolin monks train. And a lot of their, they spend a lot of time on the mind body piece and meditation. And I think for me, meditation is a way of achieving clarity and being able to see and interpret signals that are arising 
within you in respect to what's going on in your environment. And when you have more clarity, it'll allow you, even if you want to biohack, if you do the bio nurturance first, you're going to get more out of the biohacking piece. Yeah. Because you're so clear in yourself that you can, and then when you look at an HRV score and it's bad today and you're like, no, nope, I checked in with my bio nurturance meter and that's not valid. So, cause people see that all the time. They'll look at their HRV score and be like, it says that it says it's bad, but I feel great. Well then what's more right. I think your, <laughs> I think your body is and your, you know, your mind and body are more correct than any device you're ever going to have. So, but I think that's scarier. I think people gravitate to numbers cause it's scarier to trust yourself. And, um, and that's a skill that takes time. Certainly for myself, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I've, I've burned out many times and it's a constant process to learn how to listen in and, and, and cultivate that bio nurturance. It's a, it's a software program that's a slower download time than, than, you know, sort of the biohacking things. So, except that in my own experience, cultivating this inner awareness, it's, it's got some kind of like an exponential growth curve to it, right? Absolutely. At first when you're just, it's, it's a weird practice of, of yeah. dropping in deeply and really scanning your, your, your body feeling yeah. into how you're feeling. And gradually over time, it becomes almost like a superpower. <laughs> and yeah. It's a way where you can actually, you can feel before you're about to get sick, before you get injured, you, <clears throat> you tune into those early signals and it's a wonderful, it's like the best health insurance in the world to cultivate that practice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're saying there's a kind of a, a slow start and then it just goes exponentially up from there. Right. It's, and, and, you know, <clears throat> I talk about some of this in my book, super wellness, that that some of the most potent and powerful self-care and self-healing tools are those really so simple, mm. so obvious that we don't put any value to it because it's totally free. Right. But totally. actually some of the most potent and powerful tools and strategies for taking care of our health and well-being are those really simple foundational things that we skip. And we mm. tend to think something, if it, there's an app for it, if it's more sexy, fancy, expensive, that it must work better. But mm -hmm. actually my experience, the opposite is true a lot of times. That's so great. That's so great. My, one of my favorite strength coaches, his name is Mark Verstegen, and he says, uh, the best do simple things savagely well. And savagely well. Yeah. Awesome. And, if you, and if you look at all the best coaches, I would argue this in, in any field or any endeavor. Like you said, it's the simple things that are just done savagely well over time. You know, if you look at the best athletes, oftentimes you'll go to Instagram and sometimes you'll see their workouts like, well, oh, that's not nothing special or whatever, but you're not seeing all parts of what's going on there. And you're not seeing that it's really is the simple things that make you better over time. You know, um, I love that. I love that about meditation. I love that, it, that it's such a simple thing, but it's so powerful, so powerful over time, you know, joint mobility, like you're not going to notice right away when you rotate all your joints, but it's like putting one penny in the bucket every day. And if you did it for a year, every day, I guarantee you're going to feel like phenomenal in your body, but. And if you do it across years, you have a completely different physiology and a completely different life. Yeah. You're a totally different body at that point. Right. It reminds me, um, did you ever read Tony Robbins' Money Master the Game book? Or he has a new book called Unshakable that's all about, you know, like just cultivating financial health habits. And mm -hmm. he tells the story of a UPS driver who was making like 14K a year, very low income, but he disciplined himself. He had a, a mentor who said, discipline yourself to save 20%. And he was like, what? I can't do it. And he ended up doing it. And he retired with something like $70 million, wow. of which he gave away $35 million. And that's the, you know, that, that simple habit applied across years or decades becomes something so unimaginably huge that we just, we can't, because of cultivating these simple practices, they have this exponential growth to them. Totally. Our minds can't fathom the hugeness of their effect. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know, I was going to say too, with, with the simple things in fitness, like if I had somebody that dedicated to a practice of things like joint mobility and, um, you know, building that, uh, introducing the body to the feeling of, um, pleasure first or just very easy movement, uh, then I find that the body's ready to absorb more of the harder training 
Because part of it is like, are we creating the soil for which that you can adapt from stress imparted from harder exercise? But if you're coming in, or, and I, tell, I say this with strength too. So if you're coming in hypertonic, so you're already, your muscles half contracted, and then you're ex expecting to express force with the half contracted muscle. So let's just say it's contracted at 50%, even though we don't really know. You only have 50% to use, but if you started from a full place of relaxation, how much more potential you could have. And I think that's related to the recovery piece because when you recover, you're actually going to come back. Uh, you're going to be able to respond to exercise better because you're not at this middle range of like fatigue all day long. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and I think really strong people, um, especially the ones that can, that have that longevity, they are, they tend to be very calm people. Um, they don't say too much, you know, they, they spend their energy in meaningful places and don't worry about other things. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it shows, it shows in their, in their psychology, it shows in how they train and how they approach things. And, um, you know, I think we have a culture now that is just so scattered a lot of times and we're trying to do too many things and juggle too many things. And, and then when we're not seeing results, we're like, I must need to do more things and more things and more things. And it's like, why don't we peel it back? and get to the essential parts of what you really want to do. So, mm. but yeah. then is there not value still in pushing beyond our comfort zone? That was the first question I was asking is, is there's gotta be still, um, a right way to approach, you know, stretching your comfort zone when it comes to training your physiology and also your mind. You know, I know from personal experience, some of the hardest things that I've overcome in my life have, given me some of the biggest gifts in life. So sometimes being willing to go into uncomfortable places have as rewards in training our bodies. Tell us about that. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you want to change your physiology, you, you have to challenge it at some point. You're right. Um, I think the key point I'll mention this point first is that when you're a beginner and you're learning the skills, you have to acquire the skill first before you really start hitting the gas pedal. So I'll give nice. you a hypothetical here, right? Like, if you're learning um, how to deadlift, for example, and you're like, I want to be able to deadlift a thousand pounds. If you're, if you, if you don't have the mobility, you can't get into the positions. You don't know the sequencing. You don't know how to engage your torso, right? You create interabdominal pressure and stabilize your trunk to lift a heavy weight. Then trying to put more weight on the bar isn't going to make that better. And so I think the, the differentiator is, Yes, you need to push your body hard, but you have to acquire the skill at first, have some level of competency at the skill. And so going back to strength as a skill earlier, when I mentioned uh, Pavel's work mm -hmm. with two sets of five, two sets of five more frequently is actually a brilliant plan for beginners because they don't need to lift more weights. What's actually going to make them stronger, and the research is pretty clear on this, the first six to eight, even up to like, I think 12 to 18 weeks in some of these studies, what makes people stronger is their muscles actually don't really change. It's actually, it's neural factors. So they're actually increasing neuromuscular efficiency. So they're actually getting more efficient at the skill. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking to first get into exercise, you know, doing, um, crushing yourself at a boot camp class, I wouldn't recommend doing that because you're going to get better results by doing simpler stuff, especially for the first three months, most likely. Um, get better at the skill and don't worry about pushing the weights. Just get better at the skill of, of lifting. Um, and you'll see you'll actually just get stronger by just getting better at the skill. Uh, and also people a lot of times fight their own bodies. You know, they, they're not, they can't get their joints in the right position to express force. Then they're trying to put more load on an inefficient system. Um, we talked about that today with the principles of effortless power. It's amazing how strong you can be when you get your bones in the right place and root yourself into the earth, you know what I mean? Like you don't have to use strength if you are able to actually get into a position to absorb and redirect force. But um, then it feels so good to just be like, ah, oh, in the workout, sweat buckets. That is a good feeling sometimes. What's the, what's the balance there? Totally. Well, we also release these kind of, you know, feel good chemicals when we, yeah. when we work out hard too. Um, and there's a time and place for that. If, but if that's your only strategy, um, I would start to really look at, uh, you know, I would start to look at why you feel the need to keep doing that. And I know for myself personally, why I burned out was I was using exercise as a way to kind of put myself down at night because I wasn't looking at that purpose piece. I was, 
I needed it as a drug. And a lot of people do this. They use this, they go run because they're not confronting things that they need to be dealing with in their life. Uh, they're not creating boundaries with other people. They're not, um, uh, these are all underpinnings of something that's not right with that the person. And it shows up, um, you know, using, using their physicality as a way to manifest or deal with that because they don't know any other way. Um, and again, I'm not a therapist, but, uh, you know, I've been through that. I've been down that road. And, um, so I start to, you know, I start to ask people open-ended questions and get them to think about those things. Um, but certainly, I mean, if it feels good and it, the time calls for it and you're in the right place, then, then go for it. Um, you know, and, uh, getting a sweat on is a wonderful thing. And, uh, yeah. And, and also to get stronger and to, and to adapt, you're going to need to do that at some point. But again, going back to this notion of finding gears, if you're doing that six days a week, you know, you're probably not, you're not going to be able to adapt and recover from that because the whole point of, of this stimulus recovery adaptation curve is that you induce a stimulus, you recover from it, and then you adapt and become better than when you were when you first introduced that stimulus. But if you're doing six days, you're just going to keep stimulating and then getting worse, and then you're never allowing time for it to adapt. Yeah. In my super wellness book and the first module of our six week super wellness program, the very first discussion we have is what is health? Mm -hmm. Because everybody wants to be healthy, just like everybody wants to be successful, but nobody takes time to ponder deeply. What mm. is health or what is success? What is right. most of all, what is your own personal definition? Because the world will tell you a lot of things. In the world of medicine, they've had this <clears throat> overly narrow definition, actually a totally untrue definition that health is the absence of illness and injury. Right. I don't know a single healthy person who has never been injured, never been sick. Right. That doesn't exist, you know? Right. So really, usually what happens in our class is we start discussing you know, what is your personal definition of health? A lot of people come up with a definition like, is my ability to adapt to the stressors of life, mm. to learn and grow from every experience of life. Right, right. And training is the perfect analogy for that. <clears throat> Are you mm. training to make yourself more adaptive to kind of open yourself to a greater possibility of life? Mm. You know, and if you overdo it, it tips over quickly into burnout and injury. But if you don't stress yourself, you don't get the gains. Like that's the, right. That's, this is this constant dance of yin and yang between stress, recovery, stress, recovery. And if you stress and recover in just the right doses, you keep expanding your range of possibilities without mm -hmm. illness or injury. And yeah. And sometimes you have to push that edge to learn from it too, right? Like you learned, I've learned from all of my illnesses and injuries. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, I try to make a distinction between um, resilience and robustness. So robustness is like kind of this form of, of external armor building. Like I'm going to get super big and super strong to be incredibly robust to handle the world. Right. And so it, it fits with this kind of American ideal of bigger is better. Mm. And, but the problem is, is that there, there is always going to be something like you said, there's always going to be injury. There's always going to be pain. These are, these are not things that you're going to get off of this earth without experiencing. And, you know, a shoulder injury can take out a 400 pound muscular guy just as easily as a hundred pound person. So it can, I, you know, injury can take anybody of any size down to their knees. And so it doesn't matter how robust you are, but the difference is resilience. The difference between robustness and resilience, resilience is interesting because resilience is that adaptive piece. Are you learning and adapting? And that doesn't necessarily mean getting bigger, you know, <laughs> or stronger or improving your cardiovascular shape. It's about, um, can you, uh, are you malleable enough? Can you adapt and change and um, evolve in your own uh, physical practice? That sounds kind of nefarious, but uh, I think people need to unpack that for themselves and really ask, you know, going back to that purpose piece is, you know, are they building resilience or are they building, are they trying to armor themselves and build this robustness? Hmm. You know, that's deep stuff, Charlie. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I go back to it every year and, uh, and, you know, even with my own fitness mission statement, I think like, well, what, what am I doing? What is my next? And it changes when you age too. Like why you would exercise in your twenties, maybe different in your thirties. 
versus in your 40s, 50s, et cetera. So that's why I think you have to keep revisiting these things and saying, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, just like you would do with your career. Like, what, how does your physical practice enhance your life? And maybe that does mean you need to get bigger, you know, and, and for whatever reason, let's say you're a security guard. Uh, <laughs> You know, are you a football lineman? You may, it helps to be bigger in those things, <laughs> in those kind of activities. So I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad thing. But um, my friend uh, Dave Engen said something really great because, you know, trainers joke a lot of times about sets and reps, like what's the best set rep scheme and all this. And one of his clients asked him, he said, how long should I hold this plank for? And going back to the biohacking thing, you know, like people love numbers. And he's like, I want you to stay in that plank until you learn something about yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? So training is just edge work. We're finding where your edge is because you you have to go up to that edge to learn something about yourself. And if you're never going up to that edge, um, then you're never going to adapt and you're never going to learn what you need to learn about yourself. So, um, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to do a max hold plank every day. You know what I mean? Yeah. How do you think your background as a musician changes your outlook as a personal trainer? I got a lot more soul. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, musicians are very creative people. And um, I think a lot of fitness is too sterile. It's too, uh, it, it, it's too linear. And I think a lot of times a lot of fitness training is, is, um, too robotic in a lot of ways. Like we treat people like they're this algorithm, you know what I mean? We have, we must do program design to allow for adaptation, you know? And it's like, well, yeah, but humans are not robots, you know? And, uh, so I think the creative side of my brain gets engaged when I, when I'm kind of juggling all these pieces together, you know, train in a training context, we're talking about communication. There's the physical side, but we also have the psychological side, motivation piece, you know, and we're talking about getting creative with, uh, exercise selection and also dealing with beliefs. Like I talked about with mobility based conditioning. So what if somebody doesn't like lifting weights, but all you know is lifting weights? Well, you might have to get creative with injecting some strength training into that person's world because you think it's going to help them. Um, and also as a musician, I think music is just incredibly powerful in general. Like, having a certain kind of music playing during a workout can be powerful for motivation too. So, yeah. But other than that, you know, my music is, is a good kind of a good release for me too. It's just fun to, to have that, but I don't know how um, some of my clients might not appreciate my musical tastes at times. <laughs> I'm really big into Steely Dan. People really <laughs> have like a vomitous reaction to Steely Dan sometimes. <laughs> Well, at the very least, you know, I grew up playing music too, it, and it helped me to cultivate, um, I don't know if discipline is the right word, but a healthy respect for skill development. Yes. A patience towards understanding before you start those jam sessions and do improv and do fancy things. It's just, you got, just got to put in the hours of, you have to fall in love with the process of learning the skill. Otherwise, you'll never have those peak experiences. It's not possible. So I think for me, my music background helped me to see training my physiology in that same light. That's totally know? true. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, that's a really great point. Like music is just like strength training or fitness or movement. They're, those are skills to be acquired. And, you know, nobody, I don't think a mu music teacher would say, I need you to do, um, these three scales as fast as possible right away. Right. And how many scales can you run in 10 minutes? You know what I mean? Like musicians don't say that. I, I know these are not, maybe not fair comparisons. It's like a false equivalency thing. But I mean, if you look at, at fitness, like if you can't, if you're not good at the skills, what's the point of trying to like add more reps or more weight, right? Um, especially for beginners, you know, if you already have had time and skill in, in, the, in the movements, then of course it's plenty fine to, well, but what about, you know, burning calories? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to, we want to like fit into skinny jeans and burn some calories. Totally. Yeah. The calorie. So it, in all seriousness, <laughs> what's up with that? Like if yeah. you, we, we want to, what is, what's the deal with burning calories? What in your is experience? the deal with burning calories? I don't know. People are still obsessed with that. That's like a 1980s, like 
corporate weight loss thing. Like we were walking around with a pedometer and like tracks their calories. So <laughs> what's the key to weight loss in your experience? If we, <laughs> we are carrying a few, you know, 10 extra pounds around the middle, what is the smartest, quickest, and most long lasting strategy for weight loss? Uh, you know, going back to doing simple things savagely well, um, long-term cultivating healthy um, lifestyle habits is the, is the long-term strategy. You know, we have a problem with um, regaining weight. So that's the problem we're seeing in the, in the weight loss literature from my understanding right now is um, people will lose weight, but they'll often regain it and more. You know, they did a, a Kevin Hall and the NIH did a National Institutes of Health did a study actually with the biggest loser. And they looked at um, these people that lost, you know, well over a hundred pounds in this television show. And most of them gained all the weight back and more. And so one thing I'll say is that I think we also need to reconceptualize what healthy weight is. So I'll start with that piece first, because there are some genetic factors, but some people are just going to be a little bit bigger. And that doesn't mean that you're an unhealthy person because you're not 6% body fat and have a six pack. I think this notion of people wanting a six pack is, can actually be very unhealthy, especially for certain people. Um, and if you ask elite athletes that are very low, especially females, they're amenorrheic, so they don't have a period. Um, that's not a healthy state for your physiology to be in. And so this idea of creating this caricature of what a healthy you know, human body should look like, I think is going to be different for the person. And so having a healthy self-concept, I think, would be a first place to start. Mm -hmm. um, but going on from there, I think counting calories is just notoriously not accurate. You know, it's, uh, your body's also incredibly dynamic. And again, going back to bio nurturing, learning how to listen into the signals of your body and learning, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are overweight also have this disconnect between what this, they think they need and what the, their body's actually telling them. Um, another thing going back to the introducing pleasure into the body first, like, instead of trying to get people to cut calories first with weight loss, why don't we start correcting nutrient deficiencies and getting them to just eat more of a balanced diet, get more of those healthy vitamins and minerals in there. So they start feeling better. And again, the motivation will be there first uh, before they start cutting calories. Right? So what I tell people is if they're going to lose weight and I see this with a lot of females in particular, I say, if you can, don't worry about the weight right now, just start feeling better. Uh, sleeping, which a lot of people get terrible sleep. And if you're not sleeping, there's no way you can, you're, first of all, you're going to crave a bunch of, you know, uh, starchy carbohydrates and sugars and salt, because when you're not sleeping, you're in a stress state and your body's just trying to blunt that stress response. So yeah. I've seen people lose weight just going from six hours of sleep to eight hours of sleep a night if yes. they can do it. Yeah. And I've seen, and that, and that's one thing. So if you talk about like, what's the low hanging fruit, let's pick off the low hanging fruit. And sometimes it's not always the easiest to do. Some people just can't get to sleep, but if they can sleep, huge. Get them to eat more regularly. Um, get them to eat more of a balanced diet at regular intervals if they can. Uh, and then also start strength training. So again, strength training is incredibly metabolically supportive. Um, so it will help to maintain muscle. So even in, when you start restricting your intake of food, you're able to at least hold on to as much muscle as you can. And your muscle is your main metabolic engine. So if you don't have as much muscle, you know, people that have more muscle burn more calories at rest. So I always say, let, let's cultivate that resilient uh, physiology first and get these good habits in place. And then we can start talking about cutting calories. But if you look at people that are most successful, I think they don't do the, just the calorie restriction first, especially if they want to maintain it for long periods of time. And then plugging into, uh, you know, habits and, and surrounding yourself with a culture that encourages that and which is, uh, it can be incredibly challenging. You know, if you're from an Italian family that likes to eat a lot, um, and they don't exercise, you know, yeah. it can be very challenging. So, um, again, going back to your question about me being a musician, I think one of the great thing about musicians and artists is they're not afraid to be counter culturists. They're not afraid to go against the norm. So when it comes to making changes, like, it's less hard for me because I don't, I'm not as hung up on having to appeal to cultural norms. So like when you're like, you know, I have to eat this way or that way. I'm like, I'm used to being weird. So I, <laughs> it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I can see it's a challenge for other people that, um, that aren't exposed to that, you know, it's artists, you have to put yourself out there. And sometimes it's, it can be very, um, 
you're afraid of being judged. So, yeah. you know, I always think about how in our society these days, it's become normal to be chronically obese, chronically depressed or anxious, unhappy, stressed out. That's become normal in our society. Yeah. And that's a side effect of the habits and lifestyle that we call normal. Right. So is that really what the normal that we want, you know? So it's and like- the, And the needle keeps it's, moving. It's like, it, it's like this becomes more normal, even though like 10 years ago, that was not normal, right? Yeah. So why not just try something new? Because society's normal is definitely not working right now. Right. So let's break that mold and experiment and explore. Encourage right? people to be weird. It's okay to be weird. <laughs> Weird is cool. Weird Plus, is the there's thing. like more weirdos like us out there these days. We're all yeah. kind of waking up to all the old ways that don't work. You know, we're creating, in fact, we're creating a, a new normal. A normal where chronic health, chronic wellness, chronic enjoyment of life, chronic cool. feeling of joy and fulfillment, like mm -hmm. make that the new normal. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things I really love about your work, like with your, your wellness intensive, like, starting from something simple and learning to listen to your body and, and learn to interpret those signals and also just create space. Just start by creating some space. So you have a clean slate, you know, that tabula rasa, clean the slate first before you start adding more things on. And um, I think in a, in a culture that's incredibly bombarded with more and more stimulus, we need things to like clean the slate more. So yeah. Simplify. Yeah. yeah. So before I ask, ask you my last question, mm -hmm. where can people find you and your work? You can find me, uh, my website is Charlie Reed Fitness. Last name is spelled R-E-I-D, charliereedfitness.com. And um, uh, I have some blog posts on there. I haven't been as avid as a blogger as I have in the past, but I have some content on there. Um, I'm probably going to put some podcasts up there soon that I've been on so people can listen to those. Um, I host some continuing education courses uh, at the studio I train at, Move SF, which is in Pacific Heights. And... Um, uh, in, in and around the Bay Area, and that will also be on my website as well. And I have some online content on there. So I have um, a resistance flexibility, resistance stretching online course for purchase on our website, as well as my mobility-based conditioning course uh, on there as well, which are fantastic courses with my friend Jules Mitchell. I'm really excited about those products. I think they're, um, it's been a wonderful journey for me to, to go through that experience. So yeah, and other than that, um, you know, I'm just training Monday through Friday at Move SF at the moment. So, awesome. Yeah. Okay, my last question is this: If you could wave a magic wand and gift everybody, all of our audience, the whole humanity, you could gift us one gift, mm. one superpower. What would that be? Uh, I would say, uh, I would say you are enough. Let's start with that. I would say confidence, confidence is a huge part of that. And people should really be uh, confident in their incredible ability to accomplish amazing things. And uh, I don't think we have enough of that message out there too. You know, we're always looking at what we're bad at or what we could be striving to get, but respecting how awesome you already are and how like you're the result of billions of years of evolutionary success. And you, you're here now built on the, you know, shoulders of giants. So yeah, you just have to tap into it. <laughs> so. That was so awesome, Charlie. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. I hope you guys loved joining us for this delicious exploration into bio-nurturance versus biohacking, into the idea that a lot of times in life, less is more. Simplicity is the key in today's crazy world where we're constantly bombarded with more and more different distractions. Sometimes to find that truly rewarding and fulfilling life, really simplifying things down and having patience for getting the most juice out of life from the most simplest basic practices. I think that was the message of Charlie's awesome conversation today. I hope you enjoyed joining us. Please join us next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hi, friends. Did you love that interview? If you did, please leave a review and share with all your friends so that many more people can benefit from these game-changing insights. You can also go onto our website, dredithubuntu.com, and subscribe to our newsletter, where you'll receive free trainings and next-level ninja tools that we only share on our newsletter. 
together, let's turn your life into a brilliant masterpiece.